Welcome to Black Health Matters. I'm Daryl Armistead, your host. This episode is a Zoom recording of Howard University group session led by Dr. Clive Callender. So I never had social media until the pandemic. A friend of mine joked that it took a pandemic for me to get on social media. And I say, yes, it did, (laughs) because I didn't really feel like I had a need for that earlier on. Um, But we took to IG, the Instagram account, because we thought it might be a way of reaching some of the younger parents and of also connecting with the students because they're always on these social media platforms. So we built our Instagram account to provide tier one services or education around a majority of um, um, a long list of topics. So we touch on depression, anxiety, um, we touch on suicide, we touch on Um, You know, what is it like to be out of school, your comfort level with the pandemic, mask wearing, you know, different protocols, everything you can think of, um, we've tried to connect with to keep it relevant, um, but also to make it something that is helpful and um, uh, happy to say that we continue to do this. We post every day. Um, In our post, again, we put a lot of pride and time into it, trying to make sure that they're relevant and current. Um, On the other side of things, my clinicians are in the schools and they have been doing group work um, virtually. Uh, One of my clinicians has one of the kind of um, aptly kickback with Mrs. K. K. She, her name is Ron, so that's where the K comes from. But she does sessions with about 30 to 50 students and they just talk about current topics and current events, things that are bothering them, things that are um, you know stressful for them during this time of year and and so you know going on in our schools where we're pushing in the classroom connecting with students where they are we do we do things to increase your social interaction by having lunch with them. Uh, she's done things where she invited certain um, uh, students to come and John, could you put everybody on mute? Yeah. Yeah, um, and when I put everybody on mute, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hall Brown to unmute and continue. There we go. Thank you. Um, and so she uh, and the others have done some other push-ins um, where we've just focused on either social emotional learning, um, focused on um, you know anxiety, how to deal with that, coping strategies, coping skills all of that. And so that was um, another positive thing I think that, that's come out of COVID because she was able to reach and they were able to reach larger groups of students um, and, and support them through these challenges the, the pandemic has um, kind of brought forth. Um, additionally, they do independent uh, individual services as well where they will see these students um, on an individual basis. Um, so those who need more help, who may be struggling, who can't turn in their assignments, who may have things that are happening at home that no one's aware of. And in particular, students who have experienced loss. Um, there was a lot of loss this past year. And um, uh, I don't think people have really talked about it as much. The schools are aware, but they're really not sure how to handle that or what to do with that. Um, so doing it on an individual basis has been helpful. Um, just connecting with students, um, you know, one student in particular that I can think of lost four family members um, and, you know, two were parents uh, to COVID and that was really a hard thing for the student and to expect them to, you know, kind of jump back into the academic environment, I, it, you know, that's a lot to ask of someone. So trying to support students through the challenges that they face, whether that be losses or just um, loss of motivation on their own, um, different forms of anxiety, um, that's where the individual um, uh, individual sessions have become you know, invaluable. So we work with the students in the um, schools a lot to also figure out just what do they need from us as opposed to us assuming that we know what they need. And you know, sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it's crickets. <laughs> so we, we always have something prepared. Um, but we do some work with parents as well, um, lots of panel discussions. Uh, in fact, tonight there's a panel discussion that Dr. Hairston is leading um, that'll talk about um, substance use um, in the community. 
um, and that's on a YouTube channel, Black Psychiatry, at 7.30 p.m. tonight, if you're interested in that. And that kind of brings me into the other side of what I've been working on lately, which is um, I've been fortunate to be a part of what we call the Howard University Re Resiliency and Recovery Project. It's connected with the Department of Behavioral Health and SAMHSA. And this grant focuses on helping healthcare professionals, so frontline healthcare providers, as well as DC residents uh, get behavioral health supports that they may need. And we think of it as more like psychological first aid, um, where we're providing education around certain topics, um, but we're also um, providing one to three session, um, individual sessions uh, to help with acute problems or things or challenges that people are facing um, that have been COVID related or that have perhaps been developed um, during the pandemic. And that has been, um, you know, kind of a slow progression in terms of getting people involved. We've had people go to our panel discussions and our webinars. We've had some webinars on sleep. We've had some um, on uh, uh, physical health and nutrition, on um, just overall wellness. Um, what else have we done? We've done a couple, we've done a few of them in different ways and just tried to connect with um, what people were most interested in. So that is a whirlwind of everything that I've been doing probably in the last year. Um, but I want to give, you know, time for you all to also talk and connect. And um, what I thought might be helpful or I don't want to say fun, but could be, um, I could do a relaxation um, a, either guided imagery or relaxation strategy um, after we talk for a bit, if that's something you all would be interested in. Dr. Brown, uh, what is the average size of the groups that your uh, people deal with? Yeah, so um, with the students, um, the most is 30 to 50 in some of the uh, kickbacks and the lunch bunches. Sometimes it's just as, as few as two. So it really depends on how we're able to connect and what the topic is at times. Um, we really do find that if the students know the clinician, they're more likely to come. And so one of our clinicians is very outgoing, kind of funny and has really developed a great rapport with her students at her school. And so she gets a lot more people to come the others are um, maybe not as outgoing, but very knowledgeable. And they have people that come, but it could be anywhere from two to maybe 10, 12, 15, um, which isn't terrible, but it's definitely um, you know, a difference in terms of um, who's attending and not. You know, there was a data on, uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins that suggested that uh, since the pandemic, the suicide rate has doubled in African Americans, but uh, halved in whites. Uh, any comments about that in terms of your uh, uh, exposure to people who have suicidal ideations? Um, yeah, so a couple of things come to mind when you, um, you know, give that statistic. Um, we know that African Americans and people of color have been hit much harder um, by some of the challenges of the pandemic whether that be financial insecurity, whether that be um, food insecurities, um, those things have weighed really heavily um, on people of color and, in, and as well as loss and um, exposure to the COVID virus itself. So it doesn't surprise me um, that, they're, that they have this finding in the statistic. The majority of the students and families that I work with are African-American. So I don't really have a clinical basis on my own to be able to compare those two. But the numbers aren't surprising. I mean, I think a surprise to some extent is that the number of suicides or suicidal ideation is increasing in African-American community. Because at one point people thought African-Americans don't do that. That's a white person thing, right? Um, but we know that that's not true. We know that African-Americans commit suicide and contemplate suicide often. And it's one of those things where you first have to normalize it within our community, help people understand that it does occur and that it's not something to brush under the rug or to treat lightly. And then two, making sure that we have resources out there for those families and for, or for those um, who are feeling that way. Um, in fact, I think last week or the week before last, I can't remember exactly, our, I, our um, Instagram 
posts were all focused on suicidal ideation and suicide prevention because our goal was to get out the fact that it does occur in, in communities of color and that there are resources, there are um, helplines, there are things that people can do if they are either survivors of suicide um, or if they have been thinking or contemplating um, suicide and whether that be passive suicidal ideation where they just, you know, sometimes kids will say, oh, I wonder what it would be like if I wasn't here or the world would be a better place if I wasn't here. They don't really have a plan, but it's passive. But that's a sign and helping parents to understand that that's a sign is important and to not just brush it off or think of it as, you know, just something silly that the kid's saying at the time or something that they don't mean, but to really investigate and see if there's something that's going on with the child that they can help with and to support them over. How successful are those suicide hotlines? You know, I think in the moment they have, they have some efficacy, right? So in the moment when someone's feeling that way, having someone to talk to and to vent to can be helpful. Um, because a lot of times when someone is contemplating suicide, they reach out to people or they try to reach out to find someone to help them. They're, it's not as though I think people are just wanting to take them their lives, right? It's, it's because they feel like they have no other, no other recourse. They have no, no other way to deal with the things that they're dealing with. So to have someone, anyone to talk to, to listen to what they're going through at the moment, I think can be helpful. But that's just a quick fix, right? That hotline is just to help with that acute crisis moment. But outside of that hotline, they have to be able to find additional resources and whether that's going to a psychiatrist, whether it's going to a psychologist, whether that's going to the emergency room, they need to really follow up after that hotline. And usually someone on the hotline will say that because again, the hotline is just a quick fix, just something to get them out of that crisis moment where they're thinking about taking their life in that moment. But then the goal would be to feed them to or to refer them to a place where they can get more long-term help or more, um, more in-depth services. Along those lines, what, what would, uh, is the first choice for the referral? Would it be the emergency room or would it be, a, uh, especially since the psychiatrist or psychologist may not be available at the moment, uh, uh, what are your thoughts uh, about that? That's a great question. Um, you know, sometimes, well, so as a psychologist, I can, I have the ability to be able to determine kind of at what level or where someone is in their suicidal ideation, right? Um, so for me, I would ask more questions, figure out whether this is something that they really, you know, are planning to do right now, or is this something that they've just been thinking about, but it's, it's on their mind, but it's nothing that is emergent. Um, but as you know, an everyday person or someone who's on the hotline, even perhaps, you may not be able to make that determination. So the ER is always a great place to send a, a person initially because that way they can get assessed, right? It's a quick way to be able to get assessed, to be able to have connection to a psychologist or psychiatrist because they'll refer or give you information on one once you're, you're in the ER. Um, and and it's a way to ensure safety because that's the biggest thing, right? We want to ensure the individual safety and the safety of those around them. Um, and so referring them to the ER, if you're not sure anywhere else to refer them is always a, a, a good place to start. You could also call the suicide prevention lifeline. They can give you other resources in your area if you don't want to send them to the ER. And that would be perhaps someone who's having thoughts like more passive thoughts doesn't have a plan isn't in a crisis moment you could potentially call that line to get the uh, resources that may take a little bit more time to connect with um and the pediatrician for for um for students that's a great way to also connect they can give referrals they can help in that way as well as your primary care doctor um, you'll notice that often when you go to primary care now, they do depression screens. And one of those questions on the depression screen is about suicidal ideation. How often have you had it? Have you had it in the past two weeks? You know, and trying to determine whether or not that's something we need to um, support you with further. So I think those are some of the avenues that you could go down. Um, you know, again, when I think back to some of the um, families I've worked with, I know at one point I was seeing a patient, um, it was a student and um, the mother came to pick the student up 
And when she came to pick the student up, she was in the tizzy. She was kind of in a, a frantic state. And I, you know, didn't feel comfortable releasing the student to her at the moment. So I brought the mom in and talked with her. And she actually stated that she was having suicidal ideations. She would, wanted to kill herself. And, you know, I asked her, um, you know, did she have a plan? And her plan was to crash her car, um, which meant that the child would have likely been in the car as well on the way home. Um, so we had to have, you know, further discussion and try to, to take her to a place where she was, um, you know, not um, suicidal, um, take her to a place where she could, um, you know, get some support and some help and then make sure that the, the student also was in a safe place by calling the father and helping the father, you know, having them pick the child up. Um, but, you know, you get that feeling at times when something is off and, and querying and asking questions is important. If someone ever comes to you and just says something like, you know, um, you know, I wonder what it would like if I'm not, if I'm not here, I wonder what it would be like if I'm not here anymore or the world would be a better place without me or just something that, you know, it sounds like it's in passing, but it is, act, you know, it's, it's um, kind of alluding to them no longer being with us. I say investigate, ask questions, um, try to see if there's something you can do. And then again, the helpline is always there to point you in the right direction if you're unsure or don't want to send them to the ER. Dr. Brown, there's a hand up. John Buchanan's hand is up. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Hi. No, hi, Doc. Um, thank you so much. This, this information is uh, extremely relevant. Uh, I had a couple of questions. What, what would you do if the parent is in denial about the, the, the child's um, ideation, suicidal ideation. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna take them to the emergency room. I wanna handle it myself or, you know, how, how could you approach that? There are a couple of things that I would do. Um, so, you know, sometimes parents are rooted in their experience or have, um, you know, stigmas or myths that they're attached to um, around mental health. And it makes it really difficult um, to help them to understand that their child might be experiencing something. So I would try to educate them and let them know that kids their age can um, experience depression, can experience suicidal ideation. Um, Cause I think that's one myth that's out there. You're too young, you don't have anything to worry about. Why, like, how can you be so sad? Why would you, you know, you don't have stress, but kids do have stress. So having that conversation with them, it's showing them having, you know, um, giving them statistics. I do some of that. If that's not working, um, I then take a different route. Um, which is depending on the age of the child, the child can seek services on their own. So if they're 12 and above, particularly because of their behavioral health, you could see the child if they wanted to have services, right? If they were asking to have services. It's similar to uh, reproductive health in that way. Um, there's a, protected, a protection for children to seek services if, um, without their parents' consent if, if it's at that place. Um, I think you know, you try to do as much as you can to get the parents involved because clearly, you know, parents are the children's world at that point. They're living with them, they're providing for them. So you don't want to cut them out of the picture, but you do what you can. And then if by chance you can't make that change, but the child is still seeking services, you can help them with that. Um, the, the other is um, that if they're not willing to go to the ER, a lot of times they're willing to go to the primary care. So it's a little bit of how you come at it. So if you send them to primary care, that could also be another way for the child to get help and another um, trusted adult that the child could talk to. Um, I also come at it from a um, sleep standpoint sometimes. Oh, is the child sleep off? Let's talk about that. Because again, it's less um, invasive, less um, stigmatizing to talk about your child's sleep but often their mental health is tied into that. And so I'm able to then kind of go into that realm with mental health and with suicidal ideation and with depression and with anxiety. So well, one more question, Doc. Um, when you uh, started talking about uh, the services going out to the different schools in, in DC, uh, you, you mentioned uh, based on the, the need, how did you determine which schools needed services more than others? 
Absolutely. That was a question that we had. And I think that's a question that DBA struggled with initially. That wasn't something that I did. They came up with a rubric um, through a, a council. They have a council on behavioral health. Um, and that council came up with a rubric that kind of gave a score to each of their schools. Some of it was based on whether they had um, a behavioral health clinician in the school already. Some of it was based on um, uh, you know, the percentage of students who were in poverty and who had, you know, other um, risk factors that we know exist. Um, and, and then they added in a host of other um, uh, uh, factors that would give them this overall number and rank the schools. And then they went from that ranking and took, I think, the first 25 schools and then, you know, uh, did it um, as they moved forward. So it wasn't my system um, personally, it was through DBH. And there was a lot of trial and error because you know, as soon as one person says, oh, I'm gonna take this school, another school's like, hey, we've got need too. How's this person in here? Then you got the politics of just wanting to have, you know, this expansion in your school and how do you deal with that? So um, that's a great question. I think they grappled with that with the first couple of months of setting this up, but eventually they settled on this rubric that they put together um, and were, and then they ranked each of the schools and then told us where they ranked and we could then make the connection with the schools um, that we felt we could support. Thank you so much. Dr. W uh, Walton has her hand up. No. Unmute Dr. Walton. Sorry, good morning. And thank you so much for um, your presentation. Uh, mental health is something that's very near and dear to me um, having been involved with mental health for many, many years. Uh, currently, I am doing a lot of work on the other end of the spectrum with seniors, uh, particularly with uh, Alzheimer's and other dementias. One of the things that we're finding as a result, particularly of the pandemic, is that there are so many intergenerational homes where mental health concerns cross the, uh, cross the spectrum and cross the ages. Um, and dealing with it on the senior side, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, depression and significant increase in substance abuse, um, in elder abuse, uh, in spousal abuse, and in child abuse. Um, can you and and we're and of course we're also leading grief groups because because of the losses that people experience, not just in life, but in lifestyle and relationships um, and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, any suggestions or advice in terms of how to handle the intergenerational um, impact of mental health in our communities, especially in, in the age of the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, you know, I experience it as well from the, the child side of things um, when I'm trying to give recommendations or we're talking about what's happening. Um, and inevitably, you know, it comes through with the parent may also have depression. Um, you know, there may be some abuse in the home, um, but not necessarily to the same extent. Um, you know, I think trying to understand the needs of each of the members is important. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with your own mental health crisis, or your own mental health um, challenges, it may be hard for the individual to see that. Mm -hmm. But there are some group people um, that do family therapy that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and helping the parents and the families to identify really what's happening right because sometimes people just think oh um so and so's grouchy or someone so and so's always depressed or they've always been like that or this is just okay like the way that this is is how it is for everybody so mm -hmm. i don't you know i don't need to worry about it and i think helping them to see that there are some challenges that they're experiencing that can be resolved that can be supported um is always helpful 
but it's a bad, it's, 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 a, it's a lot, right? It's not, it's easier said than done. I can go into a family and say, um, you know, perhaps grandma is feeling this way and is doing this way and we need to support her in this way. But then um, maybe the grandchild is also having needs and the person who's kind of in the middle of that might be stretched trying to deal with both of them, but then may also have their own mental health needs. Mm -hmm. So I think really just trying to bring awareness to what those, what, what mental health challenges look like <clears throat> Like what, mm -hmm. what it is that they might be experiencing so that they're not brushing it off so they are tuning to it is important. And then trying to get supports in place for that family so that they're not dealing with it on their own. Mm -hmm. And again, I know that's a hard battle and a hard struggle. It's really easier to, said than done, but um, a lot of the social workers we work with do, do help with um, mm -hmm. the intergenerational nature of things because they're looking at the household as a whole. They're not coming in, you know, looking at an individual family member. Um, my work often looks at the individual family member and from that family member's point of view, I try to help them to see the perspective of the other family members in the house, but also give them coping skills to deal with what they may be experiencing um, as a result of having, um, you know, this kind of intergenerational challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I know at one point I had a, a student, she was a senior actually, um, and she, a new patient to me had come, we were talking and part of her difficulty was she didn't wanna be around her family. Like <laughs> She had been spent so much time in the house with them that they were getting in arguments, that they were having um, you know, fights in the house and her way of dealing with it was to stay in her room. Well, her family thought, well, you know, she's being antisocial, she's being disrespectful. Why does she want to hang with me? And so having them to understand that that was her way of coping. She wasn't trying to be disrespectful. She wasn't trying to be, um, you know, um, opposite of, of whatever they wanted her to do. It was more of that's just how she coped. That's how she dealt. And in that session, the mom started crying, the daughter started crying because they were able to see each other's perspective on that, where before they were looking at it from their own perspective, which was for the daughter, they're acting crazy, I need to retreat. From the mother's side of things, it was, why is she so antisocial? She needs to be with her family. Why is she pulling away? She's just acting like a teenager, a spoiled teenager or something, right? And so having those conversations does help at times. It doesn't solve everything, but helping them to see it from that other perspective and then managing what those expectations are can be helpful. Yeah, the, uh, just the incidence of the dementia piece adds a whole nother dimension to it. Um, and lots of stresses on, on families, especially because often the families are the, the primary care providers mm -hmm. and children often fill that role as well. Um, uh, that's been a, a real challenge for us. And I can imagine, I mean, I think, <sighs> I always say education, right? It seems like education, education, education. It, it's really um, people understanding what dementia is. I mean, we know that it's a memory you know, problem, but having families understand the extent of that, the details of that, I think is really the, the key, right? Um, because we do. there are certain days where that, that family member may be lucid, everything's great, everything's fine. And then another day where it's complete opposite and they need you know, care um, and, you know, to be watched over on a daily basis. And so um, that, like you said, it wears on the family members, it often falls on the kids um, and trying to find respite or other resources could be helpful. I know that there were um, services like that, but I don't, and with the pandemic, I have a feeling that, yeah, a lot of that is gone. So um, sometimes we talk about um, help having like rotating family members, so to speak, so that it doesn't all fall on one person. Um, that doesn't always help. Um, because people again don't don't necessarily um, well one they may not be available to help they may not have any other resources but two people don't um, uh, support necessarily in the way that we would like them to um, but it's tough there really is it's it's there you know I'd like to say that there's one answer for that but I think it's really family based and trying to figure out what the family strengths are what resources they have, and then what resources you can give them. That's kind of how I look at those things. What is it that they're already strong at and good at? What are things that we, what are things that they need? Um, what, what are some of the weakness areas, things that we can support them around? And then what are some resources that they might be able to take advantage of through insurance or through um, you know, some of the other programs in the area? I'm always surprised at some of the programs that they do have going on, 
um, but the pandemic has definitely slowed that down. Um, I know for students, <coughs> there's like little lights that, that helps with homework and helps give them a break from the household if they're in a household that's contentious, um, but also supports them with the academics. I don't know if there's if there are things like that for um, senior care and for um, patients. Not a sick. lot. Yeah, um, I think some of it too is demystifying mm -hmm. mental health and dementia uh, and in our communities. Uh, there's so many stigmas around it. Um, there are, and it's like, how do you educate? How do you demystify without sounding preachy, right? So it's not even it's yeah. not even about getting the information out there because sometimes. Uh, you know, we can, we can give handouts, we can, um, you know, have panels, we can, you know, talk to them, but it's often that one-on-one -on -one conversation or that really um, family to family conversation that gets them thinking in a different way. But there's only so many of us and there's so many families that are in need, you know, it, it's hard to keep up. Um, but I think from my perspective, I try to do as much as I can with those one-on-one -on -one conversations and having those conversations, but you're, you're absolutely right. Demystifying mental health, demystifying what dementia is and how that impacts a family and really letting people know that they're not alone in this. They're not the only family going through this. And this is something that, um, you know, deserves support and that can, that people can help you through. That's a lot to push mm -hmm. through. It's a lot of barrier to push through, but I applaud you for, for supporting and for working, you know, with families um, through that. I'd like to invite you to uh, come speak to one of my groups. Um, we do, uh, we have a community community group, uh, Dementia Friendly America, Prince George's, and we do a lot of community forums and that kind of thing. So I'll be in touch with you. I'll find out how to get in touch with you from Dr. Cal. Love to have you come speak to us. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 Maya has a question. Maya, you're going to have to hold your uh, space bar down in order to unmute yourself. Your space bar on your keyboard. Hold the space bar down and then you can talk and unmute yourself. Or you might need to call Reggie and ask him to unmute you. Do you know where the space bar is on your computer? Nope. Okay, it's that long key down at the bottom of your keyboard. It's the lo longest key on the board. Just hold it down and speak. Now, is that- Yes, better? that's good, that's good. Keep it down and okay. speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, doctor, you, you, you've been excellent uh, in enlightening, you know, bringing, <clears throat> uh, highlighting the uh, child issue about suicide. Now, uh, what I wanted to ask you was a lot of children, the teenagers and, uh, you know, even 12 year old girls, 11, uh, they're, they're experiencing sexual abuse in their own family, you know, by stepfathers or fathers, brothers or whoever, I don't, you know, a lot of them. And they're very, they're, they're very they, they don't know how to express this to anybody that they're, you know, sexually abused. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very hard to get it out of them. Uh, you are excellent. How do you, you know, get that out of them so you can help, the, uh, so they can be helped? Yeah, that is such a hard thing. Um, and actually that's one of the areas that I focused on um, earlier in our, um, our development of the program. Um, sometimes just asking the question is a big deal because no one's ever asked that question of them. You know, a lot of times people, they feel like people won't believe them, people won't hear them. So we, we try to ask that question um, because I think also a lot of, um, healthcare providers or professionals are afraid to ask that question because they don't want to know the answer. And so I think by opening the space, by asking that question, you give some people permission to feel comfortable to answer it and to let you know that they're experiencing something that is difficult and that they're experiencing something that they need help with. Um, we have also um, a, a, like done educational components. So we have um, a presentation that we've given called Healthy Relationships to help students understand the difference between a healthy relationship and a, and a non-healthy relationship. So they may not understand that perhaps, you know, the treatment or the abuse that they're um, experiencing from a boyfriend um, or, you know, another partner um, is 
is is not acceptable, is not the way they should be treated. Um, so having those discussions about what is um, what an intimate relationship is, what it means to have an intimate relationship, talking to them um, also about what abuse is, right? So again, sometimes if something is just happening in your household, you believe that that's what's happening to everybody. You're kind of in your own bubble. You think that that's just how life is. So trying to explain to them the difference between what is, um, I, I hate to use the word normal because there's not really a normal, but what is acceptable, what is, what is um, you know, not abuse versus what is abuse um, can also be a powerful thing for them because they're, they can realize what's happening to them they may feel uncomfortable about it, may feel that this, it feel, you know, odd about it, but they may not have the words to say, hey, I've been abused until you give them that vocabulary, until you give them that understanding of what abuse looks like, what abuse is, and then give them that open forum to have that discussion with you. Um, I can tell you um, about an experience I had with a, she had just gone to college, it was a student, um, and she, um, was fainting. She was having fainting spells. She actually came to me because she was having fainting spells and they couldn't figure out what it was. They thought it was a lot of anxiety and stress. And in that moment, we're talking about the, the anxiety and the stressors that she's experiencing. But I asked her if she had been, if she'd ever experienced abuse. Has she ever been sexually abused by a parent? Um, had she ever experienced physical abuse or sexual abuse from a boyfriend? And she broke down crying. And that was what was happening. She was actually being abused by her boyfriend and he was an older boyfriend. Um, and she hadn't told anyone. That was the first time she had said something to anyone. Um, and so we had to have that conversation. She talked to me about it. It was really hard. But then the next step that was even harder was how do we tell her mom that she had been abused? How does she have that conversation with her, the one person that could support her? And so we talked about it. I stayed in the room, I allowed her to share that news with her mom. Her mom was devastated, of course, but then we were able to find a course of action that could help her be safe and to get her out of the situation she was in. And she didn't, you know, the, the fainting spells of course stopped um, and her anxiety lessened once she was out of that situation. Um, but it was through asking that specific question that she was able to kind of release um, you know, that information to someone. And that was the first time I've ever seen her. So it wasn't even like I had, you know, developed a rapport and had been there with her for years. It was because she told me that no one had ever asked her that. And I thought, you know, wow, that that's really powerful that being able to just open the, for, the floor and give a forum for that conversation is just as important as knowing what to do after the fact, right? You need to give them that, that voice, that space. Dr. Brown, I have a question. Um, I'm thinking about the age range of the adolescents. Uh, when when uh, they are, I think depression may precede um, thoughts of suicide. So what is the age range where in, in adolescence where you start probing to find out who is maybe depressed? You know, and this hits on one of the myths that are out there, children, young children can be depressed, right? It doesn't even start in adolescence. It can start as early as four, five, six years old. They show it in different ways. It manifests in different ways. And so I'd say, and I tell my parents all the time, communicate with your children, ask them how they're doing, ask them how they're feeling, try to understand what's going on. We don't want to be busybodies, but you want to keep tabs so that you can understand what might be happening in their lives. And that starts early. That starts building that relationship and connecting with your, your, your children starts very early on. So even four, five, six, you can ask those questions. How are you feeling? And for younger kids, the depression may manifest more as a behavioral issue. So more behavioral meltdowns, uh, more tantruming, um, you know, difficulty uh, paying attention, perhaps. Those are some of the signs that may manifest then. In adolescence, we see a lot of frustration. And so very low frustration, tolerance, anger. If there's a student who perhaps is getting in a lot of fights at school, we don't automatically think that kid's a bad kid. It's okay, what's going on? What else is happening? And it could be that this kid is suffering from depression 
but doesn't have the words to describe that. And their thing is, is everybody is um, getting on my nerves. Everything, everybody is, um, you know, against me. And you start to ask more questions. Well, you know, um, have you had difficulty sleeping? Have you had difficulty um, eating? Are you eating more than usual? You start to ask more questions around depression and you find out that this teenager who is getting in a lot of fights at school isn't a bad kid. It's the fact that they're going through a depressive episode and no one has caught it. So depression manifests differently depending on the age. And I think it's never too early to start asking those questions. I have two kids of my own. I ask them often um, and, you know, sometimes they, they you, you can tell they're giving me the straight answer. They don't always give you the straight answer, but I can look at their faces. I can see what's going on. Um, I often know who their friends are, um, just trying to make sure that I'm keeping abreast of how things are going for them, um, particularly with black males, um, you know, teenage males, they, they have a thought that they have to be very macho, very, um, um, you know, um, I can take care of this myself type of attitude. I, I don't, I don't need any help. And so checking in and trying to spend time with them helps a lot. And asking those questions again, point blank, um, to give them that opportunity to discuss it with you is important and helps you to figure out whether or not they might be, um, you know, going down that path towards suicidal ideation. Um, so hopefully that helps. Yes, thank you. Um, Ms. Stevenson, Dr. Stevenson. Yes, my son Chris is here and he has two teenagers. He has a Hi. question. Sure. Hi, how are you? Good in yourself. Good, thank um, you. In my opinion, I, I believe that peer pressure now is uh, totally different than peer pressure when, when I was a teen back in the, the 80s and was it 90, early 90s. Um, <laughs> the diversity, uh, the, uh, you all being teenagers, you know, back in the day. And the reason for my opinion is because of social media. Social media is, is putting a lot, a lot of pressure on, not only just teen, uh, with the adolescents, teens, and uh, uh, the, the kids, the, even the adults and stuff, because of what this person may be doing. And we see that, and they're telling us that this is what you need to do. This is how you should do it. Because if you don't do it this way, you're going to end up in this hole that you would never ever get out of. And I don't know, it's, it sucks. Like even with me uh, to this day at, at 43 years old, I mean, it's still a lot of pressure uh, for, for me. And, um, and- You've been through it. Yeah, I've definitely been through depression big time, big time. And it's kind of hard to get, get yourself up out of that hole. You, you can sit and talk to a lot of people um, who, who are so-called the qualified individuals that will give you uh, uh, tips and also will provide you with medication, which I disagree with. Um, they need, in my opinion, I believe that we need, I'm just gonna say we, we need somebody in our age group, maybe slightly older, uh, because the ones that are slightly older, they're, they're, they more than likely have been through some of the situations that you have been through and can help you climb up out of that hole that, you, that you're slowly sinking in. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a little more than, uh, uh, that I can say about that, but how? How do you, or what, what is your opinion on how to get up out of that hole sometimes? Yeah, depression is a really... Um... It's a really scary thing because you know it hits people differently and like you said sometimes it just feels like you're in a hole and you're just sinking and you can't get out of it it's just it's really hard to climb out of and people don't understand that because they think oh you can just you know you can just shake it shake it off you can get out of that and so i think um i think you're right social media can play a huge role in that um and in fact i recommend to a lot of my parents that they you know, disengage from social media. Um, I can say personally with my children, um, my teen wasn't allowed to even have any social media um, until he was in the eighth grade. And even then I was linked to the count. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are certain things that um, I think we can do as parents. I think that we can do, you know, for ourselves even um, that seem a little gauche. It seems like a little overprotective, but really in truth, the things that happen on social media and the things that they're exposed to um, on social media 
um, is nothing like what we were exposed to when we were younger, right? When we were um, um, children and teens. And so you're right, the peer pressure to dress a certain way, the peer pressure to act a certain way, the peer pressure to um, do certain things, all of that happens. I mean, we've, we've heard, um, there were a bunch of stories, I wanna say it was about two years ago, where there were some things on social media that were having kids commit suicide. Like it was like a, a, a challenge where they would do certain acts that would lead them to commit suicide. And it's, it's horrific. And if you're not keeping tabs on your child, you don't know that they're seeing that. You don't know that they're being exposed to that. So as much as we have this, um, and they have this desire to become independent, we still owe it to them to be um, watchful and to be connected to what they're being exposed to. Because you're right, when we were younger, our parents knew what we were being exposed to in that way because they could see the TV. They could, you know, the, the phone was in the, the living room. They could hear our phone conversations, right? <laughs> we didn't have as much privacy. Um, but nowadays, a kid could be in their room with their cell phone, on the internet, surfing, connecting with adults who they think is a child but is not really a child. There's so much that they have... Um, to be wary of and responsible for, that I think we 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 own that right to be um, more um, uh, observant and kind of connected into that world of theirs. Because right. if, if not, they don't know how to handle it. We do do some psychoeducation in some of our schools, talking about how to be responsible on social media. It's not to tell them that they can't have it, because as soon as you tell them they can't have it, of course they want it. And then <laughs> they're not going to tell you that they're on it. They have fake accounts or what have you. But to help them to understand how to use social media responsibly, because social media actually can be an amazing tool. As much as it is scary and can be bad for kids, it could also be an amazing tool for them to, you know, maybe start their own business or to um, get out of their shell of their socially anxious and to try to use that for the betterment of their um you know of their life and of what they're doing but it also has that negative side where it can also make them question themselves make them feel bad about themselves you know when you see um models looking a certain way but i don't look that way or telling people telling you need to bleach your skin yeah. or you know and a lot of that you'll get these ads that pop up that you're not even thinking about. And so subliminally, you're getting these um, messages that the way you are and who you are isn't enough. Um, so I often say to children as well, even though they have certain, um, they have certain uh, IG accounts or social media accounts that they attach to just because they want to, also have them attach to some, to some that you know are very positive. So there are a couple of them that I know that do positive affirmations every day or that do, um, you know, that talk about really positive things. And so following those accounts will help that to kind of pop up on their feed. So they're also getting those positive messages on social media in addition to some of the negative ones that they're getting. Um, but I hear you with regard to kind of feeling like you're in a, a hole and you can't crawl out of it. Mm -hmm. that, that takes time. You know, you can't expect someone to, to pop out of that tomorrow just because you say, hey, you should feel better. Um, but I know I've had um, a couple of male teenagers that I've worked with um, recently and really just giving them a space to talk, helping them to understand that their feelings are, it's okay for them to have these feelings, that they will go away and helping them to activate and find, so we call it behavioral activation. That's the type of treatment that you, can, that you could use. And really what that is, is helping them to find something that allows them to feel productive and positive and connect with something other than the negative thoughts that they have kind of spiraling in their mind. Because we know when you have those negative thoughts and if you feed into them and, and allow them to keep swirling there, it only brings you deeper in that hole. But if you can find a way to disconnect from some of the negative thoughts, reframe some of the, that, that thinking, and I say reframe, but really just switch it around so that it doesn't seem like that's the end all be all and everything is negative, sometimes that helps. But it's an effort. It's a fight. It's not something that can, just happens to them. And I do tell them that it's a battle, but I'm there to help them with that battle to help them kind of fight through that. Uh, Dr. Brown, yes, I've got a question. We talk a lot about kids and social media, but could you talk about kids and pornography? That's uh, an under discussed area, correct? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, again, because of social media, because of their access to the internet, it's not even necessarily social media, it's really access to internet, they have access to porn in ways that they never had before. And again, that goes back to parental oversight and having them 
and knowing what your child is doing. Um, it, it's nothing new that people are, are that children are curious about their bodies, right? That's not new, that's always been the case. Um, but I think what is new is that they now have more access to that and they now um, can look, can see it and, and see it in ways that, um, you know, aren't traditional, right? So things that aren't, aren't traditional ways um, of having sex or having or making love or you know what, whatever way we want to talk about that. Um, so it gives them distorted views of what they should be doing and how they should be doing it and all of that. So again, we go back to education. Um, so I say one parental oversight is a big deal, making sure that parents know you can look at the history of your child's computer. You can um, connect your um, phone to your child's phone so that you know what's happening in terms of what they're looking at on their phones. Um, so parental oversight to education, letting kids know it's okay to be curious, but giving them resources because in the absence of knowledge and the absence of resources, kids will find it on their own. They'll, they'll figure out or try to find something that they can do themselves. So if you give them resources to understand their bodies, to understand, you know, what they're looking at and to give them a way to, you know, kind of answer the questions that they have, then they're less likely to seek it out in these kind of other ways. Not to say it's not gonna exist and that people aren't going to find it, but they're less likely to be, um, I say, I'd say um, influenced by what they're seeing if they know the true facts and have like the true data around it and resources for it. Um, and then, you know, just with anything else, I think there is still that stigma around the human body and sex and having those conversations. People don't like to have those conversations because they find that they're difficult, but really having conversations with your kids about sex, about what it means to, you know, make love or to, to do whatever. Um, I, I think that those are important conversations that parents need to have, that schools are having to some extent, um, but they need to know the, the, the facts versus trying to figure it out or hear it from their best friend or watching or seeking out porn or watching porn to figure out what to do, how to do it. Um, I think that's it. That, I, hopefully I answered your question. I, I'm not sure um, if I went, if I, if I hit everything that you're looking for. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I just raised it because like you say, it's an under addressed topic. And I think that the, the pressure from sexuality that could be contributing to a lot of kids, um, a lot of kids and adults, uh, uncertainty about uh, their status in life and depression. Absolutely. And I think the one, the other thing that I've noticed about this generation is they're actually a lot more open to, to, to talking about it, but also to different things. So where we used to just have very strict gender norms, you know, male, female, um, gay, lesbian, um, it's much more fluid right now um, in terms of their sexuality and how they see themselves. And so again, being as a parent and as an older adult or as a clinician, being able to understand that they have this fluidity, but not judge is important, right? I think um, they're not going to talk to you if they feel like they're being judged. But knowing that this is out there and knowing that they're experiencing things in a different way and doing things in a way that's different from how it was perhaps when we were coming up is important so that you can help them to understand their sexuality, help them to understand that what they're doing and where they are in life doesn't mean that they're a bad person or doesn't mean that they should um, you know, want to hurt themselves or what have you. Giving them that support is often what they need. I've had many students who were um, bisexual or who were, you know, who were just experimenting, very afraid to have that conversation with their parents. So they tried to learn from the internet or they're experiencing depression or they're talking to their friends, but never getting necessarily that, um, that support that they need. So they always feel like they're searching and they all, they feel like they're now in a place where they can't have conversations with their family, um, and, and friends. So. Dr. Uh, Hall Brown, uh, a question. Did you ever run across uh, cyber bullying? Yes. So that has um, been something that uh, occurs in schools. And it was actually even occurring on Zoom meetings when the pandemic first started. Um, like if a teacher would leave the room or someone would hold something up or, or you know, people would write stuff in the chat. Um, so it does occur. Um, I think 
um, making sure that there is a, a teacher presence or a parental presence is important. That's again, why I say having access to your child's account or checking in with them periodically is really important because otherwise you won't know. You won't necessarily know if someone is saying something negative to them online um, or if someone is texting something to them um, you know, in a way that's making them feel less than or that's compromising their um, self-esteem. And so I think hearing about it from the person who's getting bullied, like making sure we check in to make sure your child's not getting bullied or that the, you know, a child in your presence is not getting bullied, but also educating people about what cyberbullying is and how detrimental that can be to someone, um, particularly a child as they're developing and growing. Because sometimes, you know, other students will say, oh, well, I'm just joking or they should be able to handle it or they, you know, they know that I don't mean, you know, that I'm not being for real with this. But the person who's experiencing it doesn't always know that. And so educating people who are the bullies, so to speak, to have them understand um, that what they're doing is very detrimental and costly to another person is important. But I'd also say having consequences to it. Um, so if someone is found to be bullying or having doing this to another child, to have a consequence to that, because that speaks volumes. If parents, if teachers, if schools just let that type of behavior go, then people think it's okay. Even though our words may say it's not okay, there's no consequence to it, so it's okay. Once you start putting consequences to the bullying, consequences to what they're doing, people are less likely to do those things. And perhaps you see the incidence of it go down more. So hopefully that helps. Um, Ms. Tatum, yeah, or Dr. Tatum, I'm not sure which way. All right, Carol Tatum, no doctor. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm listening to you and I've been in that predicament. Uh, one thing, parents, and I'm a parent, mm -hmm. not all parents are educated and they don't, once you have a child, you don't have to get a degree or anything to say you are qualified to be a parent. Mm -hmm. So parents are not equipped always, and I could even look on this panel, are all the parents equipped to talk to their children about sex? Mm -hmm. Are all children, you know, and about homosexuality, about suicide, depression? For myself, I was a good old adult before I learned what depression was mm -hmm. and how to stop it. And being a teacher, sometimes children, they gravitate towards you and they lay out all these problems. And I knew I was not equipped to handle this sexuality. One girl was in tears because her parents did not accept her wife and she had married under that. And I'm going, what, you know? And then when children are talking about they broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend and how did then, and I'm looking at them, get over it or something. But I had to know who to refer them to. They may have opened up to me, but I was not equipped to talk to them about these subjects that they felt so. And sometimes I've said, oh, and even my own children, they, they get upset about something, get over it or something like that. Sometimes parents are not always aware. They wanna be by themselves. I know it's my one son wanted to have his door shut. And I guess I was like, Bill Cosby, you know, I pay for it. You're gonna keep your door open. You know, you're not gonna shut me out. But being educated and knowing what to say so sometimes we need to give parents a tool of, you know, if you can't talk to me and I don't feel comfortable about talking about your sexuality, who can they go to and even teachers? Not all teachers are equipped or do you want them talking to your children about their different problems? Because just because they are a teacher does not mean that they're equipped. I agree wholeheartedly there's so much to that you, you you hit the nail on the head in so many different ways um I, you know we all have our own specialties and our strengths and i think knowing if you know that you don't necessarily have the information the knowledge base the comfort level to um answer certain questions or to talk to your team there's nothing wrong with reaching out to others your primary care doctor finding a psychologist or psychiatrist that can help you with it um, I have had a sex talk with some of my patients because their parent didn't feel comfortable doing it. It was a single parent. He was a, it was a father that had the daughter and he, he's like, I don't, 
I don't know how to have this conversation. I don't know what to do. And so I had that talk with his daughter um, and, you know, in fact, tried to make it fun and, you know, give her boxes with um, pads and tampons and things so that she knows that it's nothing negative, um, but that this is a part of puberty and growing up. And so I think sometimes we do have to rely on those in our community to help us with that. Um, with our program um, and also with um, some of the programs that Ms. White does um, at the hospital, we try to educate teachers, try to give them um, tools to work with so that they do feel comfortable and equipped to be able to have those kind of conversations when they come up. Okay. Um, and so I know with regard to behavioral health in particular, we'll talk to teachers, we'll, we'll give them information about signs and symptoms to be aware of, about things that they can do, resources they can refer students to. Um, when it comes to sexuality, I know Ms. White, like I said, has a reproductive health program that she puts into the schools and has those conversations, particularly um, around teen pregnancy. Um, and so I think that more and more we're realizing kids spend a whole bunch of time in school, right? They spend the bulk of their day in school, at least during the school year. And so what can we do to support teachers who are there during that time period? What can we do to give them information while they're there, in addition to the academic information that we typically give them so that we can support them? There's sex education in the schools, I know, they have that. Um, but I think they're starting to broaden that curriculum so that it's not as traditional as it used to be. Where we used to focus on very specific male, female, this is what it is. I think that curriculum in some schools is broadening to capture some of the more LGBTQ topics that are out there so that they are also getting that information um, in a, a school setting, in a, in a classroom setting as well. Well, I was right in the midst, uh, you know, raised my children and then it came across to me once when my daughter was going through something mm -hmm. and um, she's really was my great niece. But when she was going through something, the schools and everything informed me that she had this privacy act and I'm this old traditional mother. What do you mean private? And you cannot tell me it's my child. Uh, she has nothing private and you can't tell me about it. I'm raising her. And then all of a sudden, if she's 18, she's grown and she has the right. And you know that really and truly when they're 18, they are still not doing any them. They still don't have any sense. But I mean, that's not what the society and everybody is telling us because even if you think of college age children there's still children but you know we got to respect the rights that they're adults and everything they're 21 but when you have someone old-fashioned like me trying to raise children and they're telling you they got the right to be private and they can't tell you their business and you're supporting them um I mean maybe parents are different these days um you're young and Chris is young maybe you feel differently about it than when I felt when my children were teenagers. So that you bring up such a great point. And I know I struggle as a parent. I think every parent struggles with finding that balance, right? Finding that balance between being the um, authority figure, making sure that they're on the right path, making sure that we are guiding them in a way that it's going to help them be successful, but also giving them their independence. Um, I can speak from for my generation in the sense that we struggle with knowing what we experience from our parents, which, you know, like as you're saying, is old school where they're kind of like, you know, you don't need privacy. Children should be um, seen and not heard. Um, you know, just the discipline tactics were different, all of that with what I know um, now as a, a psychologist, what I know now as what children are experiencing, expecting and what the kind of culture is around race children so I'm always reconciling those two experiences for myself and it, it's hard it's, it's hard for everyone um, and I think that privacy is a big issue but children have to I don't want to say earn but it's almost like you earn the right to have that privacy it's a two-way street you have to be able to trust that they're going to make good decisions and if you can't trust that then yes you have to have more oversight right it's there's that that um kind of, again, balance where if you don't have as much trust, you tend to have more oversight. Um, when you trust them more, you can give them a little bit more independence and a little bit more leeway. Um, there are things now, you're right. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier that there were some laws in place where kids have the right to seek reproductive health, to seek behavioral health without their parents' permission. 
And it's because there have been times where parents have said no, but the child really, really needs it. And so even though it was difficult as the parent to um, not have that information, you have to trust that they're seeking out services and help because they need it. And hopefully in time, they're gonna be able to have that conversation with you. Um, I know as a professional, a healthcare professional, I always recommend to my student, even if they do come to me without their parents' permission, initially, I recommend that at some point we have that conversation with the parent because I think it's important for them to engage and connect with their parent. I never wanna leave them out of the loop unless it's a parent who is committing some type of abuse or physical abuse to their child. And at that point, obviously not. But as much as possible to reconcile that relationship because the parents are important figures even though the child may not think so at that moment because of what they're going through. But I hear you, there, it's such a struggle trying to balance that kind of authoritarian um, mindset that we have, the child should be doing this. You should never have your doors closed. If you're in my room, if you're in, under my roof, you should never have your doors closed. It's my door. There's so many different ways that we can look at that. Um, like I said, I know growing up how my parents were. Um, but then when I see my children and I um, think about how I treat them, um, I'm, I'm always trying to make sure that I'm not being too hard on them in the sense that I want them to be able to make decisions and to think about things. But at the same time, I'm trying to guide them in the way that my parents did. Um, and so I think starting early is key. You can't just come in at you know, 16, 18 and try to impose certain rules and try to do things. You have to start early with them, have conversations, try to have them understand. I, uh, it, it's another old school thing, like try to have them understand your point of view. There's no understanding point of view, right? <laughs> they should just do what you say. That's kind of, again, another old school rule, but I try to have that conversation with them so that they can make that, that, that decision on their own when I'm not around. Hopefully they're hearing my voice like, okay, now is this something you should be doing? Why are we doing this? What's the point of what you're doing? Um, because I feel like I'm equipping them with the tools to make decisions versus them making decisions based on mom said not to, mom said to do, um, and them deciding whether or not they wanna listen to mom on that day, right? I want them to be able to make a decision. So I wish I had a, a really clear answer for you on how to, how to um, reconcile that. I struggle with that on the daily. I know many parents struggle with that on the daily. I think that's, like you said, that's part of life. There's no rule book. It's so unfair. There's no guidebook. There's nothing, they don't come with, um, you know, instructions um, and people don't have to be licensed to have kids, but I think we do as much as we can. And I think that we assure them that reaching out to the community is an important way to support areas maybe that they don't have as much expertise in or knowledge in or comfort in so that their kids aren't trying to seek out information, um, you know, from their friends or from the internet that might be erroneous. Daryl's hand is up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this question goes to the topic of bullying and abuse for both boys and girls. Do you see self-defense training as being a viable means of building self-esteem and combating bullying? I think for some it is. I think for some it is. And the reason why I qualify that and not say for all is because I do think that there are some kids whose personality doesn't lend itself to fighting back even if you show them how to fight back, when they're in that situation, they either feel very anxious, they're very nervous, they're very scared, and may not be able to use the training that they've been shown. So like, you know, in a, in a very comfortable environment when they're training and they're in their dojo or they're, they're in their, um, their classroom environment, they can do the moves, they can protect themselves. But in the moment, that's a different situation. So I do think that it is a great way to give confidence and build self-esteem in the sense that you're giving them a tool um, and giving them a way of feeling stronger about what their capabilities are and about what they should and shouldn't be doing. But you know, the other side of it is the verbal side of things, right? Because sometimes you can stop a... Um, stop a fight before it happens in a sense of, do you just walk away? Like, do you engage? Do you not engage? 
Um, can you find a find an adult nearby who's who's helpful? Um, you know, there are other steps before the the fighting side of things, um, but I do believe that um, giving them training could be helpful. But you know, honestly, these days when there's bullies around, it's it's rarely a fair fight. Um, I know I had one student that um, I, it broke my heart, but he literally said he was in sixth grade. He literally says he has two friends that he hangs out with because they protect each other when they're at school. So when they're by themselves, they felt like they would just get beat up because it would be like three on three on one from the bully side. Um, but when they had their other two friends, they were less likely to get beat up because they had other people with them. So there's so many nuances to this whole bullying situation that, you know, again, I go back to oversight. I go back to, um, you know, preparing the students and letting them know what's right and what's wrong and then having consequences to the bullying. Cause I think a lot of times it just goes under the radar. People aren't aware or aren't paying attention or aren't doing anything to support these students maybe because there's, it's, a, it's happening a lot. But the fighting back can be helpful in some instances. I just don't think it's the complete answer, um, you know, to solving that or to um, staving off a bully because it, it's often not a fair fight. It's often three against one or two, you know, two on one, four on one. The kids getting jumped at subways. Uh, you hear a lot about like on the way home, those fights that they used to have um, from between schools on the subway systems. That was horrendous. Um, I think there's just so, there's so much going on um, that I don't, I can't honestly say that that would be the end all be all, but I do think it could be a component that could be helpful. How about spare the rod, spoil the child? <laughs> so I laugh because I teach child and adolescent psychopathology to the medical students. In this conversation alone, it could be a half an hour to 45 minutes of my lecture because everybody has their um, opinion on this. So <laughs> That is that old school notion, spare the rod, spoil the child. However, research does not support that. And I send them, um, I send them, I know, right? But, but, but their answer and their rebuttal is always to me, well, I got spanked and look how I turned out, right? That's always, that's always their answer. Look, look how good I turned out. And I laugh and say, but we have no idea how you would have turned out if you weren't spanked. And so we do have very frank conversations about that. Um, I think the one thing, one of the things that, I was already a, a non-spanking parent, um, a non-spanking proponent. Um, I was not spanked as a child, so it's not a, um, I know, right? Look how I turned out. No, <laughs> um, but um, I, um, I had a class with um, some high school students and it was at a charter school and we were talking about spanking. And one African-American male happened to say, black kids don't know how to act if they're not getting spanked. And that breaks your heart when people think that you have to be spanked in order to know how to do right or, or in order to know how to act right. So although I know in some cultures and with some people that, <laughs> no, I see some hands going, um, I know in some cultures and with some people that spanking is a means of discipline. And so if I run across um, families that do that, I always say open-handed from the waist down on the bottom, like there's a certain way to do it, right? Um, but I think it's such a great area because where some people may think that um, they're disciplining or they're spanking and it's, um, let's just say sometimes it falls into an area of abuse, right? So if they're starting to use hangers, <laughs> switches, cords, um, you know, tracks from, um, from the Hot Wheels, Hot Wheels tracks, all the things from back in the day, those things, you know, are, are considered abuse. So hitting, hitting a child with those objects are considered abuse. Um, open hand at below the face um, is allowed and is accounted for um, within, you know, our, our DC regulations um, and mandates, but um, there are better ways to discipline our children than spanking. We don't have to show them violence in order for them to understand. And um, people will say timeout doesn't work. And I, I challenge them to say that timeout, um, if done properly, does work. Um, but I think most people aren't doing it properly. They're putting them in rooms. They'll, they'll say, they'll send their child to their room, but the room is filled with toys and Xboxes and everything else. Mm -hmm. And the child's like, sure, send me to my room. I'll go. I don't, you know, that's not a punishment to me. Um, and so there are definite ways. And again, starting early, I think 
makes a big difference. All right, uh, Mr. Stevens, <laughs> I know you had a question. Uh, You're about to go off on me, I think, about friendship. I'm prepared, though. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, child, uh, what is it? I don't know. I mean, child beating or being disciplined with uh, getting whoopings versus uh, talking. I mean, it just works on that on that individual child, the child itself. I, I know me, uh, with, with all the things that I put my mom and dad through, my mom and dad were, were I'm not gonna say were, but yes, were and are very successful. Um, very good uh, parents. Um, um, my mom didn't, didn't beat me, uh, but uh, my, my whoopings came from my dad. Um, my whoopings came from my dad. And, and truthfully, I feel like if I did not uh, receive those whoopings and some of the beatings, um, I don't think I would have turned out the way that I am right now. Even though right now I'm not perfect, I'm still learning. Uh, and I, I actually, I pray about it uh, a lot uh, when I say my prayers at night and, and, and grace that uh, um, I thank God for all the, the good things that happened. And I also thank God for all the bad things that have happened. Because without those bad things, we don't really learn what could be right and could be wrong for us to uh, progress in the future. But but those whoopings that that I received, and like I said, I, I don't think I would have been as successful today. Now with my kids, I never touched my door. My wife never touched my door. My son, one time. One time, and uh, some some of the uh, members in this group can actually vouch uh, how well mannered and disciplined that my kids are. Um, we we we've done a lot of talking uh, in our earlier years. We didn't live in one of the best neighborhoods. Um, I mean, my mom and dad did eventually, <laughs> but but for for my wife and I, my kids, we didn't live in one of the best neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we didn't think it was that bad until we moved away from it. Mm -hmm. But um, our kids, even though they played with the, the kids in, in the area, uh, in the neighborhood and stuff, uh, <laughs> we had them in a different school versus the, neighbor, the neighborhood school. And I believe that if we had them in that neighborhood school, our kids would probably would have been uh, excuse me, their mentality would have been a, a lot different. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did not have to, you know, lay hands on them, uh, praying hands. That was those are the only hands we had to do, just praying hands. <laughs> but um, I don't know, my, my, my son, uh, or our son, uh, we, um, he just graduated, uh, not only high school, he just graduated uh, uh, what is it, community college as well. He has 65 credits and he's 18 years old. Get ready to proceed on to uh, Towson University to become uh, an engineer. Yes. Uh, well, that's, that's his major. Um, my daughter, she's in the 11th grade going to the 12th. She has a 4.1 GPA. Uh, she attends uh, Elizabeth wow. Seton and uh, she's doing very, very well. So it just depends on the child themselves on how you need to uh, discipline. Like I said, with me, I need it. <laughs> we don't want to take over your session, Dr. Brown, but a lot of what you're saying, I can relate to. And in the middle of it, my son comes in, what's the topic for today? And I told him, and he said, I need to say something, but it's so relevant. Number one, more recent in your conversation, the beatings, whoopings, and someone said, uh, it's a black thing. Oh yeah, he got a lot of beatings. I had two boys and I had to beat him all the time. He's not only a wonderful kid, as I call him, he's a great adult, great father. And he and I were having some discussions just last night about the past year and a half. We've had a lot of uh, change in our family um, as far as his kids are concerned. My grandkids, mom and dad separated. They divorced within this past year and a half. They moved from the family home and sold the family home. So the kids' home life was disrupted. Their granddad passed. Their dog of 14 years died. Look at what's happening to them today. 
My grandson just graduated at 18 with an AA degree and going on to college. My granddaughter in her school, uh, she's in a private school. Um, she'll be a senior next year and she'll be a pharmacy technician in high school. Um, they persevered. You talk about sending them to the room, that's okay, but don't leave them in the room. Knock on the door. Something on your mind, you wanna talk? You have to keep that open conversation. Um, I feel like I raised them, but I'm raising the kids and then I re-raise him. Once a mom, always a mom, always. always a mom. I mean, I can preach all day, but I know we've been in this a bit longer, but I just wanted to voice our life's opinion and I think we're doing okay. Okay, uh, Maya, will you hold your space bar down and you can ask your question. Hold the space bar, the same one. We let her answer first, please. There you but go. Let her answer first, please. Let her answer first, please, okay? Maya, let, let Dr. Brown answer uh, Ms. Stevenson's response first. Okay. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I, I hear you. Um, and I, children above all are resilient. And if you can give them the right environment and context to kind of flourish, they always surprise you. They always do more than what we, I think, expect of them. And I, I, I was clapping. I don't know if you saw I clap, all of that. I am so pleased and proud to hear yeah. about your grandkids and um, just how amazing they have come through all this. Um, but I do believe it's because of your support. I, I, I think part of me wants to challenge the notion of you saying that um, your son had had to be hit. Um, but you know, I think we'll never know, right? We'll never know what would have happened if he hadn't have been hit. Um, and I think what above all, what I try to um, what I try to stress with my families is that hitting shouldn't be your first response, right? Hitting shouldn't be the first response that you have when your child acts out or does something that you don't approve of or what have you. I want to give them many, I want to give them options. I want to give them tools in their toolbox so that they have other means of dealing with and, and kind of helping their children to get through, um, you know, these developmental years. If you feel like spanking is what is necessary at the moment again that open-handed on the bottom i'll say that but i want them to understand that that shouldn't be their first resort that there are other things to try because i don't think that all kids need to be hit or that mm -hmm. um or that even some of the kids that we think of as bad absolutely need to to be hit there might be another way that we might you know, that we can communicate with them or get them on the right page. But, you know, we can't go back in time. We can't know. And for all intents and purposes, your son has turned out amazing. Mm -hmm. he's, he's had two amazing kids. Uh -huh. So in that vein, I think you've also provided him with a very um, strong environment and context to be able to flourish in um, so that he can develop and grow um, into the man he is today and, and the kids that they are today. So I applaud you. Thank you. Congratulations. All those things come out of that. Mm. No, thank you. And it does take up not only the spankings. I agree with you 100%. It's open conversation, Absolutely. constantly talking to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Sorry. Um, Maya? Uh, doctor, you're doing a wonderful job. And I want to congratulate Janice and Carolyn Tate for their honesty. Uh, they came out very well, you know. But uh, see, I'm from India, okay? Now we did not touch America. It's a lot of immigrants here in this country, okay? And uh, we're talking uh, uh, mostly about typical American family. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, coming from Asia, okay, and African children, we have to be completely obedient to our parents, even the children that are here, Indian families, Asian families, African families, they, they have to be completely obedient to mother or father and father. Otherwise there's a very big consequences of getting punished and I mean, you're not gonna be happy, you know? And we have to respect our elders. They have power over you to punish you and uh, Tell your parents what bad things you did when you're nine, 10 years old, you're doing something bad that your parents told you not to do. Yes, they have the right to do that too, you know? So 
there I think that the, the you know the respect for the older generation for your mother and father who gave you birth you know mm-hmm. and uh, and the father stands out as a disciplinarian and girls have to be separate uh, and uh, uh, so I, we don't see that much of rebellion and uh, disciplinary problems in Asia and Africa because uh, it's totally different culture, thousand. This is mostly common among European culture people I see and those who are in America and all that. But from third world countries, the, the children, are, they don't, uh, I don't see that much of problem. Even in churches and all, I go to the third world churches and oh, they're very obedient to their mother and father. It doesn't matter if you're 50 years old, mom and dad said this, you're gonna respect it because that's mom and dad. And even if it's not your mom and dad, they're like gods, older people. They worship them. Africa, they're very, very respectful mm-hmm. to older people. So, you know, I, I think we have to look at cultural backgrounds too. I think culture plays a big role in it. And that's actually a part of my conversation that I have with the students when we talk about child medicine and psychopathology, that we have to be culturally competent. And we know that there's certain things um, that are um, strong within certain communities, right? There's certain cultural aspects to communities um, that, um, you know, that pervade their mental health or that um, can either support or detract from their mental health. Um, but, I, you know, as much as there are these cultural factors that play a role, everyone is susceptible to behavioral health challenges, right? Just because you're from a different culture doesn't mean that you can't get depression, doesn't mean that you can't have anxiety. And I think that making sure that we dispel those myths and making sure that we understand what having anxiety may mean in a particular culture is important. So listening to our patients as they come in, listening to our families as they come in about what their background is and what their cultural experience is, and then tying that into what they're presenting with, I think is always important. And, you know, there's always, there, there are a lot of studies out there about cultural assimilation. So families that immigrate to the United States um, from different cultures, and then how that assimilation impacts that first generation who's kind of caught between what they know from the past and what's happening now. And then even that next generation who's just, you know, ingrained in whatever um, the, the current culture is, which like the European culture. Um, there are, there are battles and struggles there. They may not talk about it as much, but there still are battles and struggles, I think, that occur within those cultures. They may look at it differently or, or um, approach it differently. But I, so I, I want to make sure that I say I completely agree with you that um, cultures handle things differently and that being a, pr- a practitioner, being culturally competent is very important to me. But I also want to stress that even within other cultures, behavioral health concerns exist. Um, parenting concerns exist, right? It's still not easy to parent no matter what culture you're in, um, but you're right. We're just perhaps looking at it through different lenses and through different cultures. Well, thank thank you. you very much, Dr. Brown. It's been an hour and a half already, and I think uh, we're blessed to have you be so kind as to take so much time with us. And uh, Yeah, there's one hand yeah, up, Dr. Counter. It's huh? been up for a long time. There's one hand that's been up for a very long time. Yeah, but, and so thank you very much for a wonderful uh, uh, and so this will be the last question that has been up for all time. And after that, we will uh, let Dr. Brown leave because I think we're taking advantage of a, a wonderful opportunity. Oh, my pleasure. Thank Bonnie, you. unmute and you can ask your question. Bonnie Burnett. Yes. Um, I don't have a question. Um, but there is a book that I go by. And while I understand and respect everything that has been said, uh, this book that I uh, read says, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I know that you don't spank a child for just everything. Talking has its place. Reasoning has its place. And so you have to use good judgment but as for me and my house, I go by that book first when it comes to rearing my child. Dr. Spock, nobody else can tell. That's the book that I go by. And I'm not going, I don't believe in abusing children because if you want to make me angry and come to you, 
abuse a child. You don't do that. But I, I go by that book first. <laughs> That's my statement. Okay, I, I hear you. I, um, and I, I think a lot of people do. I, I, I think the, the things that come out of or that I um, struggle with with the state being made is just good judgment. Everybody doesn't have good judgment, right? Everyone doesn't know you know, when to stop beating a child, when to, you know, when too much is too much. Um, and I think, you know, there's that, there's that phrase, but common sense isn't common. Um, I think that goes along with judgment. <laughs> it's, just, it's such a gray area that for me using, um, you know, spanking as a first line of defense, I think it shouldn't be. I think there are other things that can happen. I'm not saying that no one should ever spank their child if they feel like that's what they need to do but there's a way to do that one and two I think there are other options that they should try before they even get to that point so I hear you the good judgment part is the one that like I said I, I kind of question and then the idea of the gray area of abuse where some someone might think that it's okay to hit their child um, with um, their hand, but another person may think it'd be okay for a child to punch for a parent to punch a child. You know, again, that idea of what abuse is is very um, very wide. Some people don't see hitting their child with um, cords, extension cords, with switches, with um, with train tracks, with um, their fist, with whatever else is nearby as a form of abuse. But actually the statute in DC labels that as abuse. And if you see any kind of black and blue marks or welts, we're mandated reporters and have to report that. So I think that um, I understand your position. I just um, worry that um, everyone may not have the judgment they need to be able to follow suit with what you're talking about. Well, again, thank you very much, Dr. Brown. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think you realize how popular you, you would be and that we oh. keep you this long. But we're very <laughs> grateful that you've done such a spectacular job. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. It was a, a pleasure to be here with all of you and to have your questions and to be able to just talk. I, um, I, I truly enjoyed this morning. Um, and thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Uh, okay, uh, so I think we've had a great session today, and we've had a lot of opportunities to hear uh, all sides of the story. And uh, uh, so uh, let's see, we'll see each of you next week, next Thursday, and have a great weekend. Yeah!